Okay, um, well, I'm gonna start by following Kelly's example and not following Jean-Francois' example. <laughs> Uh, because I've been married for a long time now and I would like to continue to be married so I'm gonna say thank you to my amazing husband <laughs> who's also actually an economist by the way um, and I'm gonna also Jean-Francois I'm gonna thank your wife because um, I think you're gonna be in trouble otherwise um, and I do also want to thank uh, you, Jean-Francois, for your very nice comments. Um, and I want to confirm that that Scotiabank research you guys did on child care, you did it just as I was becoming Minister of Finance. And it did have a real impact on me. So thank you for doing it. I think it's going to have an impact on a lot of Canadians. So thanks a lot. So, it is so wonderful to be here in person, and that's where I want to start today, with how great and how novel it is for us to be here in person and en masse. Because that novelty is a reminder of just how hard the past two years have been. Let's remember, a little more than two years ago, we were in the throes of the deepest recession since the Great Depression. Our economy had contracted by 17%. Three million Canadians had lost their jobs. And our government had just deployed wartime spending to prevent a complete collapse. In the aftermath of 2008, our economy remained sluggish for years. The Depression scarred an entire generation. In June of 2020, looking ahead with history as your guide, you would have been forgiven for expecting the worst yet again. Instead, We've recovered 117% of the jobs that were lost during the darkest months of the pandemic. And that compares to just 96% in the United States. Instead of persistent unemployment, the unemployment rate is today just 5.1%, a record low. Young people, indigenous peoples, women and new Canadians have particularly benefited from the strong job market. As Jean-Francois said, not me, him, uh, this is the strongest recovery in the G7. It's the strongest jobs recovery in the G7, and Canada's real GDP is 1.8% above where it was in those awful first weeks. But if the data is so rosy, if the rebound is so strong, and it really is, why don't we feel very good? Why are Canadians so worried? I think everyone here knows the answer. Inflation. Jobs are plentiful. Business is booming. But it's also harder for a lot of Canadians to pay their bills at the end of the month. Now, I rode my bike here today, and my aforementioned husband and I are raising three kids in downtown Toronto without owning a car. Now, we can do that because there's a subway station barely 200 meters from our front door, and our kids can walk to school. But the house I grew up in, in Peace River, Alberta, is about 10 miles from town. And I got my driver's license the day I turned 16, as did every other kid in town. I understand keenly that millions of Canadians drive a long way to the store, and that today they will wince when they fill up their tank and when they buy their groceries. 
And I know that many of them are asking what their government is going to do about it. So that's what I want to talk about here today. The pandemic has been, we hope, a once-in-a-generation crisis. But like any major crisis, this one has aftershocks, and inflation is chief among them. Inflation is not a made-in-Canada challenge, and it's actually less severe here than among our peers. Inflation in Canada was 6.8% in April. It was 9% in the United Kingdom, 7.4% in Germany, and 9.2% across the OECD. In the US, it was 8.6% in May. So this is clearly a global phenomenon, one driven by factors that no single country is responsible for and that no single country can insulate itself from. We know the causes. First, the pandemic. The shift in demand from services to goods it triggered and the resulting supply chain snarls, which I heard about very personally just this morning from Marty Wiener at his family-run hardware store in my neighborhood. China's COVID zero policies have made the world's supply chain problems worse. And then Vladimir Putin illegally invaded Ukraine, forcing up the price of food and fuel. Here in Canada and around the world, that means higher prices at the checkout counter and higher prices at the gas pump. Now, Canada doesn't have a say in Beijing's public health measures, and we clearly aren't consulted when the Kremlin makes its war plans. I, I sure am not. <laughs> no single country can solve these global problems. But what we can do is help Canadians weather this newest storm, just as we've done over these past two years, with a plan. We will take real and tangible steps to get inflation under control and to make life more affordable for Canadians. So here, in five parts, is how we're going to do it. First, let me start by recognizing the central role of the Bank of Canada. For more than three decades, it's been the bank's responsibility to tackle inflation here in Canada. I reaffirmed this central mandate in December. The bank has begun the work of bringing inflation back within target, and it has the tools and the expertise it needs to keep inflation from becoming entrenched. In reaffirming our AAA credit rating after I tabled the April budget, S&P specifically cited the strength of Canada's government institutions as one reason for our exceptional rating. At this time of global economic and political volatility, undermining Canada's fundamental institutions very much including the Bank of Canada, is highly irresponsible, not to mention economically illiterate. But while fighting inflation is the central bank's job, good government policy can make it easier by tackling the supply constraints which are driving the rise in prices. Ce qui m'amène à mon deuxième point une pénurie de main d'œuvre de travailleurs qui ont les bonnes compétences entrave les économies industrialisées du monde. Le Canada n'y échappe pas. Résorber cette pénurie était parmi les objectifs fondamentaux de notre budget du mois d'avril. 
Notre plan pour y arriver s'inscrit dans une série de mesures que Janet Yellen, la secrétaire au Trésor des États-Unis, que j'aurai le plaisir d'accueillir au Canada lundi, désigne comme étant l'économie moderne de l'offre. L'économie moderne de l'offre reprend l'idée fondamentale de l'économie de l'offre, à savoir que l'augmentation de l'offre est essentielle à la croissance, mais préconise une approche progressiste, axée sur les personnes. Elle consiste à investir dans le cœur d'une économie prospère, les gens, les Canadiens. Ainsi, nous investissons dans l'immigration, les compétences, les garderies et le logement. Pour ce qui est d'immigration, j'ai de bonnes nouvelles. À une époque où les grandes économies du monde ont désespérément besoin de travailleurs qualifiés, la population du Canada est celle qui a enregistré la plus forte croissance parmi les pays du G7 depuis 2016. En 2021, nous avons accueilli 405 000 nouveaux résidents permanents, une année record dans notre histoire pour l'accueil de gens. Et nous visons à en attirer 451 000 par année d'ici 2024. Au cours des six premiers mois de 2022, nous avons déjà accueilli 204 000 nouveaux résidents permanents. Au moment où l'hostilité a... Oui, c'est bon. Et vraiment... Au moment où l'hostilité à l'égard de l'immigration est en hausse dans la plupart des pays industrialisés, l'attachement tout particulier du Canada au multiculturalisme nous donne un avantage concurrentiel et stimule la croissance économique. In the budget, we also set out to invest in the workers who are, are already here. That means ensuring our skilled trades workers can afford to travel to the parts of Canada where their services are desperately needed. It means investing in the skills and the training that workers will need for the good paying jobs of tomorrow and supporting union-based apprenticeship training to bring more people into the trades. And it means programs like the Canada Workers' Benefit, providing more than $3.6 billion in estimated support this year, which will make life more affordable for our lowest paid and often most essential workers. <laughs> and as we've heard, on childcare, the economic argument is clear. It is economic malpractice to force women to choose between their family and a career. <laughs> Early learning and childcare is feminist economic policy in action. And so, despite legitimate concerns about whether we could actually do it, I am so glad to be able to say to you today that we have already signed agreements on early learning and childcare with every single province and territory. <laughs> and we're building an affordable, universal system of early learning and child care at precisely the right moment, a time when our economy urgently needs every mother who wants to go to work, provided that she has the comfort of knowing that her children are being well cared for 
and well taught. And our plan makes work and life more affordable for middle-class Canadian families. It means a reduction in fees of 50% by the end of this year. In three years, childcare will cost an average of just $10 a day right across the country. As Canada's workforce grows, we will also need more homes. But today, we're just not building them fast enough. The subject, by the way, also of excellent bank research, thank you. That's why perhaps the most significant commitment we made in the budget was to double the number of new homes we will build over the next 10 years. The federal government, provinces and territories, cities and towns, the private sector and not-for-profits, all working together to build the homes a growing country urgently needs. <laughs> Taken together, immigration, housing, skills, and child care are quite clearly social policies but they're economic policies too. This set of measures will help drive our continued economic growth in a way that fights inflation by increasing the supply of the workers and the homes that we just don't have enough of. The third part of our plan to combat inflation is fiscal restraint. We spent an extraordinary amount of money to make it through the pandemic. Eight out of every $10 re invested to rescue Canadians and the Canadian economy, more than $300 billion was deployed, rightly, by the federal government. But there is no such thing as a blank check. Our ability to spend is not infinite. That was true when interest rates were at historic lows in the spring of 2020. And it is most certainly true today. Canada has the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7. And as the Bank of Canada withdraws monetary stimulus, our government is likewise withdrawing fiscal stimulus. In fact, Canada's rate of fiscal consolidation is tied with the United States for the fastest in the G7. Now, I'm determined to see our debt to GDP ratio continue to decline and our deficits continue to be reduced. Our pandemic debt must and will be paid down. In tabling the budget in April, I reaffirmed this as our fiscal anchor, and I committed to a review and a reduction of government spending, because that is the responsible thing to do. Now I know that my fiscal prudence surprised many in this room. Yes, I do read your predictions. This fiscal restraint was very intentional. At a time when inflation was elevated, we knew we needed to be careful not to increase aggregate demand. As interest rates were set to rise, we understood the importance of maintaining Canada's AAA rating. But you know, even as I say that, I can hear the gentle mockery, or maybe not so gentle mockery, of the people I went to public school with. They would tell me that you can't fill up a truck with a AAA rating. And they would be right. Which brings me to my fourth point. Making sure there are enough good middle-class jobs for Canadians. For most Canadian families, paying the bills starts with having a good 
job. C'est pourquoi, pendant la pandémie, nous nous sommes concentrés sur l'emploi et sur les moyens de maintenir les entreprises à flotte et d'aider les travailleurs à rester sur le marché du travail. J'ai mentionné plus tôt que notre taux de chômage est aujourd'hui le plus bas qu'il n'ait jamais été et que nous avons récupéré 117 des emplois que nous avions perdus au printemps 2020. Notre taux de participation au marché du travail a presque atteint un nouveau record. Au pire de la pandémie, il était raisonnable de craindre que nos jeunes deviennent une génération perdue et qu'ils n'aient pas la chance de s'épanouir puisqu'ils ont grandi dans une économie en déclin. Aujourd'hui, à l'inverse, ils font leur entrée sur le marché du travail le plus dynamique que nous ayons connu depuis des décennies. Au lieu d'avoir un marché du travail marqué de façon permanente par la COVID-19, nous avons affiché le meilleur rendement en matière d'emploi jamais enregistré par Statistique Canada. Ce résultat n'était pas acquis. Nous y sommes arrivés en adoptant les mesures qui s'imposaient et en nous concentrant sans cesse sur les emplois. This means, as we face elevated global inflation, that more Canadians have a better job than ever before. Which brings me to my fifth point, helping Canadians directly with the challenge of affordability. Now, some people are calling for new government spending, whether through tax expenditures or direct payments. And on that point, I have some good news. Because of investments we have already made in the last two federal budgets, a new set of measures is coming into force right now to help the Canadians who need it most. This is $8.9 billion in new support for Canadians this year. And this is our affordability plan. This affordability plan includes, one, enhancing the Canada workers' benefit at a cost of $1.7 billion in new support for workers this year to put up to an additional $2,400 into the pockets of low-income families starting this year. Two a 10% increase to old age security to old age security for seniors over 75 which will provide up to $766 more this year for more than 3 million seniors <clears throat> 3 a $500 payment this year to nearly 1 million Canadian renters who are struggling with the cost of housing. Four, as we've discussed, cutting childcare fees by an average of 50% by the end of this year, with savings for a family here in Toronto of up to $6,000 per child. A lot of people have told me childcare is like a second mortgage, and I'm so pleased we're gonna be able to relieve that burden. Five, dental care for Canadians earning less than $90,000, starting with hundreds of thousands of children under 12 this year. <clears throat> and 
And six, the indexation to inflation of benefits including the Canada Child Benefit, the GST credit, the Canada Pension Plan, old age security, and the guaranteed income supplement. The Fed <laughs> The federal minimum wage, which we increased to $15 an hour, is also indexed to inflation. So for a family here in Ontario with an income of $45,000 a year and a child in daycare, this affordability plan could mean about an additional $7,600 above existing benefits, more than 16% of their annual income this fiscal year. A A senior with a disability, say in Quebec, could benefit from over $2,500 more this year than she received last year. A recent graduate living in Alberta could receive about an additional $1,600 in new and enhanced benefits this year compared to last year. So the measures in this affordability plan represent entirely new support for some of the Canadians who need it the most right now. $8.9 billion that they did not receive last year. But I'm at the Empire Club. I would imagine there are some fiscal hawks in the audience. And I want to say to you, fear not. This is new money for the Canadians receiving it this year. But these are all measures we built into our last two budgets. These are measures that have already been accounted for in Canada's AAA rated fiscal framework and in the economic projections that many people in this room have been making. Now, given the uncertainty in the global economy, would it be wise for me to stand here and, roll up and rule out the need for further support in the future? Of course, it would not be. But many of the most vulnerable Canadians are already receiving more financial support today than they did last year. And they will continue to receive new support in the weeks and months to come. For the Canadians who need it most, this will make their lives more affordable at exactly the right time. The five points I've spoken about today, respect for the central role of the Bank of Canada, investing in people, fiscal restraint, good jobs, and a new affordability plan will help sustain the robust recovery we've made from the COVID recession. Our plan will help tackle inflation and make life more affordable for Canadians. I'm confident that our plan is the right one, but I do not underestimate the economic difficulties and frankly, the uncertainty of the months to come. We've been through two years of remarkable turbulence. Our challenge now is to land the plane. And a soft landing is not guaranteed. But fortunately for all of us, there is absolutely no country in the entire world better placed than Canada to achieve that soft landing. That is certainly the view of the IMF, the OECD, and Moody's, which have all recently predicted that Canada will have the strongest real GDP growth in the G7 this year and also next year. 
They are so right to be bullish on Canada. Despite unprecedented emergency spending, our finances are and will remain sustainable. We have a diverse, growing, and supremely talented population. We're a country where skilled workers want to move, and we are a people who welcome them. Alors que le monde connaît le virage économique le plus profond depuis la révolution industrielle, nous investissons également de toute urgence dans la transition écologique. Agir pour le climat n'est plus une débat politique, c'est une nécessité économique. L'économie mondiale est en train de changer. Et nos clients du monde entier ont clairement fait comprendre que ce n'était pas viable de polluer pour créer de bons emplois et de la croissance à long terme. Une prix nationale sur la pollution est l'incitatif commercial le plus efficace pour l'action climatique. Et celui que l'on a mis en place met plus d'argent dans les poches de huit familles sur dix, ici, en Ontario. De la construction de batteries pour les voitures zéro émission, aux investissements dans le captage, l'utilisation et le stockage du carbone, nous nous assurons que le Canada est le chef du fil d'une économie mondiale en évolution et que les Canadiens en profitent. The April budget also included measures ranging from a new Canada Growth Fund that will help attract the private investment we need to build a cleaner and more prosperous Canada, to an innovation and investment agency that will help our traditional industries thrive in a changing and competitive global economy, and our small businesses to continue to grow and create good middle-class jobs. We're working out the details of these plans now because we are very serious about tackling the productivity challenge that remains Canada's economic Achilles heel. Now, as I look around this room, I can see enthusiasm for the concept, lots of nodding heads, but also a little skepticism about whether we can actually get it done. And that's fair enough. Canadians have been hand-wringing about productivity for at least three decades. And yeah, you laugh, but it's true, right? How many conversations have all of us been in about that? And we just can't seem to make a difference. But we will this time. And to build your confidence, let me give you three examples of big things, big changes that our government has accomplished. We have a carbon price that has been upheld by the Supreme Court and is lauded as a model by the IMF. We have a technology sector here in Toronto that is outpacing Silicon Valley. Yeah, we, we take it for granted now, but it wasn't so long ago that people thought that would be impossible. And we showed them we could do it. And, of course, we have a national child care program, something that had been long promised, 50 years of promises, but never delivered. Major change is possible. We've shown that during these past seven years. And on productivity, do not doubt our commitment. So, I began by describing the hostile global forces making life harder here in Canada. I'm going to conclude by talking about how a dramatically changing world offers truly historic opportunities for us here in Canada, tomorrow 
and in the years ahead. The hopeful and entirely open post-Cold War world order that we tried to build starting on November 9th, 1989, the day the Berlin Wall fell. That ended on February 24th, the day of Vladimir Putin's barbaric and illegal invasion of Ukraine. It's over. In its place, we are entering a new era, a period of friend shoring, a period in which our allies know that it's worth spending a little more to build their supply chains with other democracies. And as the world's democracy... <laughs> the world's democracies have grown more united in the face of Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. And as they have grown more united, Canada absolutely stands ready to provide our allies with the resources they need. I think it really is our job, and I think we need to do it, and we will. Europe is determined to wean itself from Russian energy. A huge, huge shift. But its people must still heat their homes. These past months have reminded us all that security includes energy security. And Canada is working hard to help provide it for our democratic partners. We have a wealth of the critical minerals and metals that our allies need for everything from phones to electric cars. And our hardworking farmers grow the food that can help feed a world threatened by Putin's blockades. We are the only G7 country with trade deals with each one of our G7 allies. And that is a partnership more important in the days to come than it ever has been. The future of the global economy does not belong to those who believe that the size of their armies or the harshness of their censors or even the extent of their natural gas reserves will allow them to act with impunity. The good jobs and prosperity of today and tomorrow belong to the workers who are the heart of the world's democracies. And nowhere will that be more true than here in Canada. So we know that the road ahead will be bumpy and that we cannot see around every corner. If the past two years have taught us anything, it's that we would be naive to expect otherwise. But for all the challenges we face today, Canada remains the best place in the world to live, to work, to raise a family. Ensuring that remains true for our children will continue to be our focus, my focus, in the weeks, months, and years ahead. A Canada where life is more affordable, where everyone can earn a decent living for an honest day's work, and a Canada where nobody gets left behind. Thank you very much. Merci. <laughs>